Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Aaron Falk. Uh, this is the hot RFC lightning talk session. Uh, the purpose of this session is to create an opportunity for folks who are looking for collaborators in the IETF to uh, have a chance to speak briefly, um, talk about their problem or uh, their, uh, their idea, uh, and, and give enough information so others who might be interested will uh, know enough to follow up. Um, and so each talk should include uh, some information on how to collaborate afterwards. Um, there are in the agenda for this meeting, there are uh, short abstracts for each of the presentations and they all include uh, email addresses and some include some additional information for how to follow up. Um, so really the goal here is to, um, to try to connect people together. Uh, and um, uh, the way, so this is the first time that we've done this uh, as a live online meeting. Um, I'm sure that most of you have done a lot of live online meetings recently, so I think that the mechanics should be pretty familiar. Um, uh, but because these are intended to be lightning talks, I'm going to be pretty strict about the time allocation. So you've got four minutes. Uh, when your four minutes are up, I'm going to interrupt you and ask you to wrap up if you haven't already. Uh, and um, uh, I will um, be making um, just the sort of the WebEx interface. Uh, I will set you as the presenter when it's time for you to present. Uh, and uh, um, you can show the slides from your own machine. I think we've got one case where I'm going to be showing the slides. Um, and I think that is everything that I wanted to say to introduce. So um, our first speaker is Mike McBride. I'm going to set them to be the presenter. And um, Mike, if you would uh, unmute yourself and start, and I will start the timer. Can you see my screen okay? You, yes, now you're doing the presentation. Oh, yep, looks good. Okay, great. Thank you for letting me do this. So, yeah, so we have this uh, data discovery topic that we've been batting around, several of us, and uh, we wanted to present this to this uh, crew just to get a feedback. Uh, hopefully others can participate. Maybe someone will tell us we're crazy or someone will say this has already been solved or yeah, maybe this is a good idea and we need to figure this out. So this is data discovery. We do have, we do have a couple drafts that we're uh, kind of describing the problem. Um, so this did evolve out of a, a series of edge computing side meetings. Uh, this is not edge computing specific, but we in these edge computing side meetings identified a variety of gaps. And one of those gaps was data discovery, discovering data uh, that's distributed across the edge and how to find that data across different edge, database, edge databases and um, needing to evaluate that. So that's how this has created. So, so what's the problem? Um, the problem is that we want to lo locate distributed data in a standardized way. Uh, there are many proprietary ways of doing that. Uh, AWS, Macy, and uh, IBM has a solution. There's many of the ways you can do that. Um, <clears throat> but we need to find a standardized way of doing so. Data may be cached, um, copied, or stored across multiple locations in the network en route to its final destination. And so we're trying to find a way to do, um, and we haven't come up with any solutions, just the problem. Uh, kind of come up with a standards-based solution to discover where the databases exist throughout a network first and then where specific data objects are located that we're looking for. Um, so the location of each data store is the first level discovery program uh, problem. And then the details of the database directory is the second level discovery problem. So um, so what's data? Data can be, you know, anything. We're the kind of the use case that we're looking for is um, you know, finding statistics, measurements, temperature. One of them is using an elevator, for instance, when you have sensors all over the elevator and you're trying to gather that data, whether it's vibration or braking information or speed or capacity or whatever, and then find out where that look, where that data is located. Um, and data can be a program, it can be a service, uh, and it can be a resource, you know, CPU or memory, things like that. So that we're trying to find ways to, to find that data. Um, so, you know, what's next? So we're, we're trying to determine if existing protocols will work here to do that. Um, you know, you may be able to find ways to extend uh, existing protocols, um, DNS, for instance, uh, 
uh, that may not be a good idea, but it's, you know, one way that we've been discover, uh, thinking about of maybe trying to find where certain data is. Um, if not target where a new standard protocol may be needed. Uh, we've been, we've presented this in COIN, uh, Computing in the Network Research Group in the IRTF, but, uh, and we'll be having a discussion this week in, this next week in COIN. Um, but, you know, maybe if it's, if this is valid work, then maybe we someday will try to, you know, create a, a working group of first going through the BOF. So um, that's really, that's really it. Uh, please look at the drafts. This is how you can contact the authors. You can email me directly if you wish to uh, help provide some feedback or get involved in the work. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mike. Um, that was great. Uh, I'm now making uh, your own Sheffer, the presenter, who's going to give the next talk. Uh, your Thank own. you, everyone. Start whenever you like. So, hello, everyone. I'm your own Sheffer. I'll be talking about ciphertext format. This actually is uh, related in a way uh, to the same uh, problem domain as, uh, as Mike's in that he's looking to discover data overall. I'm looking to, uh, to be able to uh, find out uh, encrypted data and attribute encrypted data back to whoever generated it. Um, so there are uh, lots of standards for the ciphertext, the raw ciphertext. What do you do when you encrypt something? Uh, what do you get when you encrypt something with uh, AES, for example? Where does the nonce go into? Uh, where does the authentication tag and so on? But if you have a huge amount of encrypted data uh, around the enterprise, in many, many locations, many databases, many files, um, it's just not enough uh, to have a standard uh, for the ciphertext. You need something else, something extra, um, usually a set of headers prefixed to your row ciphertext uh, to determine where it's coming from. And there is, surprisingly enough, there is no standard uh, for this kind of metadata uh, around encrypted data. There's, there are some standards for uh, data in motion, uh, some standards in the PKCS 11 and KMAP world, but no, real, no standards uh, for data at rest that apply to more than one uh, key management system or more than one library. So the goal is to have, a, to some degree at least, self-identifying encrypted data and to enable interoperability of uh, encryption libraries and key management systems that are related to them. As the standard format should include at least key identity and a way to version keys so, so as to allow for key rotation. Of course, it needs to be extensible, um, just like any other uh, broadly used uh, format. Uh, it's very important uh, for the uh, data header to allow for detection of encrypted data. So there must be a way uh, for someone who doesn't have the keys to look at this column in the database and say, hey, this is all encrypted data. Um, and it, it follows this standard. And in fact, one fixed byte is good enough uh, if you want to detect the crypto data at scale. Um, and it needs to support granular, <clears throat> sorry, granular key management um, where people use key wrapping or key derivation to have a very large number of keys uh, possibly uh, a different key for each uh, encrypted field. There is an early draft of the proposal. I'm looking for uh, partners uh, to work on this with. And uh, if you're interested, please reach out to me. Email is simplest. 
we can set up an informal meeting uh, next week uh, and then decide uh, to take it to, it could be a BOF, it could be SAG, CFLG, or somewhere I haven't even thought of. Uh, so again, if you're interested, my email is here, and if you have the slides, there's a link to the uh, very early proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yaron. Okay, our next speaker is Shigeya Suzuki. I'm making you the presenter. And Shigeya, you can start whenever you like. Hi. Um, I'd like to update, uh, provide an update on uh, the Blockchain Governance Initiative Network, which I mentioned several times in the past few ITFs. Shigeya, yeah. I, I apologize for interrupting. Oh. Can you uh, go into full screen mode? It's um, your uh, slides are very Okay, okay, sorry. It works? It's working? Better. Thank you, yes. Okay, sorry. Um, let me pro uh, provide an update on the uh, begin, uh, which is... Uh, um, a multi-stakeholder community for addressing issues in the blockchain ecosystem uh, with among uh, several stakeholders, not only the engineers, but also the regulators, consumers, and the commercial. Um, we think that uh, we need a solve some certain kind of, uh, of problem related to, to the, for example, the development of how we can um, secure the blockchain system or um, provide some way to to uh, tackle with uh, anti-money laundering uh, scheme, for example. So we have uh, launched um, the group uh, in March, finally. And uh, currently we have two active working groups, which one is a governance working group, uh, which is to try to design the community itself. And uh, I'm uh, one of the co-chair of the governance working group. And the other one is uh, IAM privacy and the key management study group, which is working on uh, uh, key management or other issues related to, um, uh, related to the blockchain um, key management. So um, we are currently focusing, uh, governance working group is currently focusing on the mechanisms of organizing, organization of the beginning itself. And uh, we are drafting it, uh, uh, two documents. Uh, one is a process document and the other is an IPR process document. So this is a uh, usual stuff for the such, such type of a community, but uh, we need to the, the version which is adjusted to, for, for us. And we are preparing this for the next uh, general meeting and we will be ready for the draft is ready soon. The other thing is that um, privacy and key management study group, which has a two work stream. One of them is a key management outwork stream, and the other is the decentralized financial technologies and privacy identity and the traceability work stream. That is a very long name. And uh, they, both of them are, are currently developing documents. And, uh, and there is a uh, um, draft already on the Google Docs, so you can review it if you like. And uh, then it is possible to, to join and uh, speak up if you have interest or you'd like to comment. We are currently planning a first Leo uh, general meeting in a block called the block number one meeting in the late November. That is the 20, November 23rd and 25th. And the team time is adjusted to uh, Bachelor Mumbai. So the, it will be the uh, noon to 3 p.m. UTC. So please come to join if possible. So the agenda will be tutorial on the working group and the study groups discussions, of course. And the information that on the registration is available from this link, which you will be you can find from the PDF I'm going to upload. So to begin to join the beginning uh, uh, in general uh, for, as a member. Uh, please uh, visit the website above or just contact me to find out uh, uh, if you want to discuss uh, uh, on this thing and uh, you you want to know more, a little more about this, then please let me know. I'm uh, happy to communicate with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shigeya. 
Our next speaker is Pascal Urien, and I am going to uh, share the slides from my machine. Uh, Pascal, you can, uh, let's see, go to screen. Pascal, you can start any time. Uh, so this talk is about your app everywhere, anytime, which relies on two ATF drafts, uh, TLSSC and TLSIM. An open implementation of this draft is available at GitHub. Next slide, please. What is the concept? You want to put your application online, but for privacy reason, you want to keep control. For that, application is embedded in a secure elements. Secure elements have several form factors like SIM, by the cal can be also integrated in SOC. Secure element evaluation assurance level is about five to six, given a maximum value of seven. Your app server works over a TLS 1.3 embedded server. TLS SC stands for TLS secure element and is described by an ITF draft. Your app client works over a TLS 1.3 client, which means that client credentials are stored and used in a secure element. TLS EM, IM, which stands for TLS Identity Module, is described by an ITF draft. You see on your right, your app working over a TLS 103 embedded server over an external TCP IP interface. Next slide, please. So why TLS 1.3? Because it is a state of art for communication security. It is a result of several years of debates between security experts at the ITF. Privacy is announced by Diffie-Hellman exchange over elliptic curve. Channel security relies on authenticated encryption with associated data. Server and client authentication are based either on public key infrastructures, PI, or pusher key, PSK. So TLS, TLS SC 1.0 works with iOS CCM cipher suits, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, and 32 bytes pusher key. Next version will support PKI. Next slide, please. This slide shows an application. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's, is it the, the, the next slide? So can you go before? Uh, okay, we, uh, so I am lost, uh, okay. Um, So, uh, this slide uh, shows a uh, TLS 1.3 basic exchange using uh, TLS IM and uh, TLS AC. TLS IM is optional. You, you can choose a pressure key based on password, the hash of a password, for example. And uh, your app is running uh, over the TLS uh, SC application and embedded in a secure element. And the PSR acts as a kind of super open code. So next slide, uh, please. So this slide shows you an application example, a blockchain key store, the right part show ASCII command used to generate key, to set key, to compute key, according to the BIP32 specification and to sign transaction. The left part is a low-cost prototype board. An Arduino menu is used, uh, is used as reader for secure elements. It manages the ISO 7816 protocol and provides you interface uh, with the Wi-Fi SOC. The Wi-Fi SOC has a TCP IP stack and performs network, network exchange. Uh, so next slide, please. Scalability is an important issue, still open. Is it possible to deploy your ARP in the internet? That's the question. On the left, a trivial use case, a simple socket IP and port is used. As illustrated in the middle part, multiple ports may be used with single IP address. And finally, on the right, a single socket IP and port is used by several server names. Server name is an extension included in the TLS hello message. So secure elements can be identified by example by 15 bytes uh, by located in the answer to reset message as described in the TLS EC draft. So next slide, please. And and, and um, thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you, Pascal. 
need to stop sharing here. Next speaker is uh, Li Yijiao. Uh, and uh, she's going to be talking about Dynecast. Yijiao, I'm making you the presenter. And you can start whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, hello, uh, this is Ijo speaking. I'm going to uh, give a briefing on the dyne cast or the dynamic any cast. Uh, the a quick capture of the idea is trying to routing the service request based on both the computing and the network metrics. Okay. Uh, this this page tries to uh, to to illustrate the problems in edge computing uh, with the increased deployment of edge computing. Uh, from the operators, we find that there could be a very large number of edge sites. For example, there could be a couple of edges for each district within a big city. And another feature of the edge is they have very limited computing resources and the computing resources are varying all the time for each of the sites. So naturally it comes to a question which edge is the best to route a computing demand to. So here we try to focus on the computing uh, service. So um, there are three aspects we want to consider. The first one, uh, which one is the best? We, we need to consider the computing resources and the load attached to a particular edge site. Um, probably want to choose the most lightweighted one. And the second to consider is the what's the net, network path quality to a particular edge and what's the network status. Uh, and the third aspect is since the computing resources and the uh, network status all vary over time, so we want to know all this information in real time. So that's the problem we are trying to uh, tackle on. So to illustrate the concept of Dynecast here, uh, here I'm using a like like a five G five G deployment here uh, as for illustration purpose, but it's not necessarily to be the five G backhaul uh, deployment. So basically, we have two uh, MEC site uh, MEC sites, and there is a there is a client comes in, and then. Um, with the most current practice, normally this edge computing request will be handled by the local MEC site, which is site one here. But it could possible that, um, for example, because uh, in working hours, the industrial park usually have much higher load and the residential area uh, normally not. So in some of the cases, uh, the the uh, the CFN node here, which is a, a mini data center gateway here, can de can determine that this this computing request would be best handled by uh, the MEC side too. So that's the uh, green line shows where the data flow goes. So the client normally use the Anycast address to access a service, and this packet would be routed to the best edge in terms of both the computing resources and the load and also the network status. And which one to be chosen is transparent to the client. All client knows is the Anycast address to access the uh, service. That's why we call it the dynamic Anycast. So there would, we, we, we presumably there should be some uh, protocol change, both the data plane and the control plane. So the, uh, the brown arrow lines there uh, indicate there should be some control plane uh, information change from the server to the uh, to the data center gateways and also between between the uh, between the uh, data center gateways or the CFN nodes, which are the blue lines here. So we want to uh, actually we want to propose uh, three features to be supported in Dynecast. The first one is the Anycast based service addressing methodology. Then the second one is to uh, ensure the flow affinity. Then the third one is the computing aware routing. Uh, 
to this this slide show the activities we are going to have for the com for the coming idea week. We are having a side meeting on Wednesday. Uh, it starts five minutes after the ITF plenary ends, so it will be a seventy five minutes session. Uh, so the webex uh, can be found here, and also the webex can be found uh, on the side meeting wiki, which is uh, URL here. So the purpose of it, we are. We're trying to understand the use case problem space and review the framework and also discuss the potential work and the where to fit them in ITF. So you're welcome to join us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we, our next speaker, I think may not have uh, joined yet. Um, do we have uh, Zadago Sako on the call? I'm not seeing anybody by that name in the participants. Okay, I think not. I'm going to move on to the next talk. So Massimo Nilo is going to talk about Android explicit monitoring app as soon as I can make him the presenter. Okay, Massimo, you can start whenever you're ready. Okay. My name is Massimo Nino. I will present uh, our work about an Android explicit monitoring application. Uh, what are the goals? Uh, our goal was uh, a mobile tool for traffic performance monitoring in of encrypted transport protocols, also using the explicit flow method for measurement. Uh, the explicit flow measurement employs few marking bits inside the header of each packet for loss and delay measurement. It's protocol independent, it is valuable uh, particularly for encrypted headers. Full quick. Um, the idea was to giving the monitoring power to customers. Our application is an Android um, application based on the Ericsson SpinDump open source code. Then, okay, the name of the uh, application is Team Quick. We presentation and a app uh, live demo and uh, the hackathon that is just, uh, that are just finished. The first idea was already introduced in the last uh, uh, author FC in July and uh, was how to measure network performances with user devices. There is a YouTube video that you can see. Uh, there are also two related drafts that uh, describe the details, our, uh, the, the, idea, the ideas behind and uh, the details. One is uh, about explicit flow measurements, and the second one that is uh, just a new draft is a user device explicit monitoring. Here are the links. Uh, here is, is the link to the project, to the library on GitHub. Here, there is uh, some screenshots of uh, the application. The idea uh, is to play, is uh, placing the explicit performance server on the user device that give uh, many advantages. Uh, for example, in terms of scalability, in the measurement precision, and in saving in the hardware deployment, for example, uh, hardware deployment for the probe. Uh, a good uh, idea was to have a real-time mobile traffic monitoring. In this example, you can see the, for example, the list of connections and the details of the, uh, of the measurements. Uh, exactly, for example, uh, when you launch uh, the YouTube application with the video that flows continuously, you can see directly in real time what happens to your connections on the network and what are the, the measurements about the time or loss and what kind of connection are you using? Uh, the operators with the customer permission may use this information to identify network problems and improve, improve the customer experience. What are the main, main features of the uh, application of this uh, mobile application? Uh, the first is the customer choose whether to mark his mobile traffic or not to mark making it monitorable by the Android application and the network probes. 
The second feature is also okay that the customer choose whether to share the performance data, for example, uh, that the app on his mobile phone has collected. Uh, the first, the third feature is that uh, um, should be possible in the future to put performance thresholds on the probe in order to signal connections with problems to the network operator. Thus, the network probes will primarily monitor only the, the connections that are affected by impairment on loss or delay and help to localize the problem. Uh, if you want to next Monday, and, uh, we have the ICPM working group meeting and we will present our two drafts. Um, and also, okay, we participate in the hackathon with this uh, development. And here you can uh, find our contact uh, details. Thank you, Massimo. So that was our last talk. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Uh, presenters, if you haven't already done so, please either uh, upload your slides yourself um, or send them to me and I will do so. Uh, and um, uh, if folks heard anything that was interesting, feel free to follow up directly with the presenters. And, uh, and also send me feedback uh, on the format uh, for this. Um, I thought it moved along at a nice clip, and I'm happy to continue doing it this way, but um, I'm interested in hearing from other folks as well. So thanks, everybody. Have a great ITF week, and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Aaron.